Hi, I'm Paul Hagopian, and welcome to New Food, a podcast about the people changing the way that we eat and drink. Today's episode is about the seemingly bright future of non-alcoholic spirits, wine, and beer. Thank you for stopping by. Okay, nice. All right, well, Nick, Nick Bodkins from Poisson. Very good. Poisson, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's good. Um, I think you guys are probably the biggest non-alcoholic bottle shop in the country. Yeah. And you are the co-founder of it. Yep. Thanks for stopping by and talking to me today. Really uh, appreciate yeah. it. No, excited to be here. I want to kind of give just a sort of table of contents of what I what we want to talk about today. So I um, have been writing about non-alcoholic products for like the last month or so. Uh, tasted a bunch of spirits, tasted a bunch of beers, liked a lot of them, tasted that owls that you got there. Um, but I think there's been a lot of coverage over the last couple of years about the rise of non-alcoholic yep. bottle shops, post-pandemic stuff, people, you know, being sober curious. Yep. Do you kind of want to look about how it's actually going today and then where the industry is going to go over the next five, 10 years? So I figured you'd be the perfect person to talk to that. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to have you here. Awesome. Yeah. There's a lot, there's a lot to unpack there. For sure. Yeah. Um, so I just want to start, where are you guys as a business? Where are your, where are your stores? Um, and kind of how'd you get there? Yeah. So, um, we started, uh, the business, um, very early in, well, late 2020, physically opened in 2021 um, with a single location in Brooklyn. Um, we are now um, eight locations across the U.S., uh, primarily focused in New York and California now. Um, we're about to open our ninth location in Miami. Mm -hmm. um, but more than the shops themselves, we also operate the largest e-commerce platform for NA, as well as um, wholesale import and distribution. So, in like the traditional alcohol world, there's like three tiers of distribution, right? There's like the manufacturer and the importer, the distributor, the liquor store, the restaurant, and then the consumer. Without that sort of regulatory piece, we're kind of actually spanning multiple tiers. Sure. Um, so in some instances now, we actually import products that we carry, um, and then we distribute them to ourselves. And then we also distribute them to hundreds of other customers. Sure. So why... like? Can you make the case for me on why you guys need brick and mortar stores? Yeah, so um, I mean, I, I can make I can make like the sort of like sort of uh, no brainer consumer sure. um, uh, reason, and that's that this is a new category, and in a new category, the the biggest hurdle for consumers to um, to actually like say yes to trying something is to taste it or to experience it for the yeah. first time. Um, I don't think that that happens on grocery store shelves. Like, you're not going to stand out on a four-foot section at a Target, like, while you're also there to get, like, garland for the holidays sure. and, like, milk and butter. Yeah. Um, or whatever you get at Target. Uh, it's a lot more than milk and butter, right. obviously. But um, so, so that's the first piece. Like, from a business standpoint, um, if you compare our customer acquisition cost at retail yeah. to our customer acquisition cost online, like, not even close. Like, it is so much less expensive for us to acquire a customer at retail mm -hmm. um, than it is to acquire one online. And most importantly, like, if a customer abandons their cart online, you have no idea why. Like, sure. you could kind of do some, like, inferent, you know, like, inferring, like, what it is exactly. But, like, having that conversation with a customer in store about, like, what did you try? What did you like? Um, I think a lot of what you see so far in this category has been, um, and I'm sure you've probably, I, I think we've, we've talked about it a little bit before we started recording, but like, um, it, a lot of the direction that people have seen this category go is like, I want to mimic X. Sure. Right. And there's always going to be like, I talk a lot about like taste Delta, right? Like what you think it should taste like versus what it does taste like. Mm -hmm. The more esoteric the ingredient or the grape varietal or like whatever it is the less the taste delta is because you actually don't have a frame of reference, right? right? Like if you like, if you try like Sonoma Cretraire Chardonnay from California, they're like, My we all, one. oh yeah. I yeah. mean like oaky as hell, just like absolutely, you know exactly what it is. Mostly because it's not a single vineyard. It is hundreds of thousands of liters of bulk wine that has been scientifically perfectly balanced to make sure that your mom, no matter whether she gets this year's version or last year's version or the, 33rd production runs version. It's exactly the same every right. time. Yeah. If you try that as a non-alc wine, a de-alcoholized wine, there is a taste delta between the two. Like, sure. just full stop. But, like, try, like, a Chenin Blanc from 
South Africa or from, from France mixed with two other esoteric grape varietals that you may not be as familiar with. And it's going to be like a nice, like well-balanced, citrusy, fruit-forward white wine that you don't have that like direct comparison to. Um, everything I just said does not come across in an Instagram ad. Like totally. we no. cannot have a nuanced conversation in an Instagram ad or in a Google ad. And so when you look at what our, co- our stores actually cost to operate, um, we believe we're, we're essentially going to market telling our customers we're the curators of the best of the category. You can trust us and we will always bring new and interesting products to those retail stores and to our platform in general. There may be days that the products that we carry in our stores are in grocery and we don't carry them anymore, and that's okay because that means that the category, category is growing up. Sure. Um, but, like, retail for me is, has been a no-brainer since day one for that exact reason. Gotcha. Not to mention, like, our stores themselves, you can go on our website or onto our app and you can have product in an hour. Like, that's actually faster than Amazon. Lots to unpack there. Yeah. I feel like the one thing I haven't heard you say before is taste Delta, and I know we yeah. <laughs> like that. Um, you can imagine that like on a slide. Yeah. Yeah. It looks yeah. nice. <laughs> you know, yeah. consultant, you know? Yeah. Um, but the one thing that we were talking about earlier, which I kind of want to like unpack a little further is okay. Non-alc, all the spirits that I tried, the ones that I like the most yep. the, are the ones that have, you know, they're darker, they're normally more bitter, yep. but they don't always try to replicate maybe a tequila, a gin yep. or whatnot, which has kind of brought us all in this office, the, the realization of like, if you're doing non-alc, like why do you have to play by the same rules as other people? That's a great and question. And I feel like that's where all the success is. Yeah. Um, do you see it like kind of heading, the industry heading that way over the next couple of years? Yeah, I mean, you know, this is like, I guess, uh, being slightly more philosophical about like the category in general, so sure. forgive me, but like, if you look at the most prolific NA options, it's beer. And the reason why it's beer is because there was a product innovation that led to NA beer be becoming better, like an actual scientific product innovation. And because of the level of consolidation within the beer industry, they were able to capitalize on the product innovation much faster. Right. If you take a look at even spirits, um, but especially wine, wine is tens of thousands of producers from thousands of growing regions with all these different wine varietals we're getting there on the product innovation side, but it isn't like, aha, like we found this thing and now let's go get it out into the world across like Guinness and Heineken and Estrella and like all these other brands. Like it's going to take longer for that stuff to get to market. Um, But that's a great question. And I think it's one that we've been actually saying more and more to the brands that we talk to, like it's okay to break the rules. Like Gen Z is a Gen Z is like a perfect example of like it's the least drinking generation in a hundred years. They're doing other things. We'll just leave it at that. Sure. But like they're not drinking alcohol at the same level uh, as as Gen X, Gen Y, millennials, baby boomers, silent generation, by a huge margin. So if you tell a Gen Z consumer, I've got a great Czech Pilsner you should try, they're like. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't drink Czech Pilsner. So there is no taste delta there. What they want is a complex adult beverage that helps them relax at the end of the day, spend time with friends, whatever the occasion is. And it, like we were talking a little bit about like, like alcohol has done a really great job at compartmentalizing and defining the occasion. Totally. I know I want a beer at a Yankees game. Exactly. Right. I want like, a cocktail on a date. Like, exactly. Yeah. Uh, like wine is for food, right? Sure. Like beer is for sports bars and like hanging out with friends and like what like you can sparkling wine is for celebration. Like we know exactly what those moments are because we've been bombarded with tens of billions of dollars of advertising telling us that's the way that we should consume. That's the way we should think about it. And so this category There's two forks that you're going to see it go down. You're going to see the mimicking that looks just like alcohol because that's what, for the most part, a bunch of marketers and operators that came from the alcohol world are trying to do. And then you're going to have the other fork, which is we have no idea what you're going to create yet, but it's going to be completely new and interesting and different. 
and I think that there's a place in the world for both of them because I think there are different consumer behaviors and reasons why people do that. Um, but I'm really excited about the right fork. Like I, I've said, like alcohol is five minutes from midnight, and NA is five minutes, uh, uh, or alcohol's five minutes uh, from midnight uh, to midnight. NA is five minutes from midnight. Meaning, like we're like almost at midnight f- for alcohol. NA is just scratching the surface like we are just getting started um and it's really difficult sometimes to like even find those even as i'm like trying to explain my like justification or like or rationality for it like it's hard to describe sometimes to people that have not been as into it like how exactly there there are so many different consumer sets that that see this category as being important for them for very different reasons sure and on that right fork, you've got yep. something like a hop water, right? Yep. Which I didn't know existed probably until a couple months ago. Um, I was in Florida over the yep. weekend. I was at an ABC liquor store down yep. there. Huge sort of like placement on like the shelves, cardboard cutout for hop water. Mm-hmm. That feels like something that has like a very high approval rating from what people have tested. I think I yep. saw a big wire cutter article and they yep. were like, Oh, this stuff's great. And I know other people make it other than just the hop WTR brand. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Jordan, Jordan their, their team, like, they've done a great job with um, that category, that subcategory. And do you guys carry that? Yeah. And how is that doing in the stores? Um, it, it does really well. I mean, I think in general, um, the fact that you saw it at an ABC liquor store, yeah. um, they're, like, I'm never going to be able to compete with Whole Foods when Athletic gets into Whole Foods and starts offering 12 packs for $19.99. Mm-hmm. That's not going to work for me. But, like, the same way that I'm happy for Heineken to spend all the money on Formula One, which, by the way, like, I'm a huge Formula One fan. So, like, I was like, yes, this is great. Like, yeah. something else that, like, that they're doing, they're, like, elevating the category. Um, a lot of people don't like Heineken. And so, like, the next, the next question is, okay, well, like, I don't like that NA. What else do you have? And so, like, they're actually doing a lot of the work for us. Um, we have we sell a lot of hop water, and I think like we sell a lot more hop water at our stores than we do online because online it's all about like oh can I add it to my Amazon cart or my my Whole Foods cart or whatever. In the context of a grocery order, they're looking for like and it's a great strategy. Hop water is going to market the same way beer generally goes to market, which is like on a roll down truck from a beer distributor into as many points of distribution as possible, and that's great. Um, our stores for the most part have been a slightly more curated collection of products. And we look almost weekly at like what's in and what's out for that exact reason. Um, so it's done really well for us and I think it will continue to do really well for us. Um, how, how often does that sort of curation update? I know you guys weekly, oh, but like you products literally come in and off the shelf. Is it every single week? Um, as I'm sure, like we're sitting in your office and you guys probably get a fair bit of, samples yeah here totally. um we like have to stop and like turn away samples at this point because there's so there is a proliferation of people just being like i'm gonna bring this stuff like i'm gonna bring xyz to market and like the question now becomes like why are you better for example than hop water and like what about your process your founding story the quality of your liquid or your route to market is different right because like at this point Wine, super easy. Like, we just started carrying um, a de-alcoholized Pinot Noir from Rachel Martin, who makes Pinot Noir and Chardonnay from San Luis Obisto. She is a incredible winemaker that makes alcoholic wines that get incredibly good reviews. And she called me up and was like, listen, I'm thinking about de-alcoholizing 1,200 liters total of my Pinot Noir. What do you think we could sell it for? And I was like, well, what do you sell the alcoholic version for? She's like about fifty-five to seventy dollars. It's like it should be the same amount. Sure. And she's like, "Do you think that consumers will actually spend that much money on NA?" I was like, "Yeah, like absolutely they will." And we've sold. We, we're having to hold back now some of what we actually have available to make sure that we can fulfill restaurant orders that have added it to their menu and that we'll have enough to be able to like allocate it out during dry January and into the beginning of next year because she won't have the next vintage ready until April or May. And especially with de is wine, there's like a correlation between the input and the output, right? Yeah. Like the better the wine is. Yeah. And like, I imagine a lot of the wines that are on the shelves now kind of stink. Not, I, not your so I'm saying the input wines that are going into these de Yeah. I mean, I, look, I, like this is not, 
like I don't want to be like controversial or or mean or cruel to anybody that's like come out with with a dealkalized wine, but like, or, or I guess I should also preface this by saying I'm not gonna be uh, I, I'm not intending to be cruel to Yellowtail, but like I talked sure. to you about that. Like, if you had never drank wine before in your whole life, and I was like, boy, do I have a wine for you? <laughs> You're gonna try this Yellowtail White Zinfandel. It's gonna be amazing. Like. Not great. I wish it's, that was my mom's favorite wine. <laughs> It'd be so much cheaper. Exactly. It'd be yeah. way, we'd be way cheaper. But like, just in the same way that you wouldn't do that with alcoholic wine, yeah. if your goal as a supplier is to bring a brand to market that that your wine itself costs a dollar twenty, and then you put it into a bottle and you get it bottled and it's three fifty. And then you sell it to a distributor for seven dollars, who then sells it to a consumer for fourteen dollars. You're basically starting at the I want to get a bottle to market between fifteen and twenty dollars, and there's very little room there for what your actual input can be at the top. Right. And so, like my wine shop on Court Street, Scottos, like those guys don't carry Yellowtail because no one walking in off the street into that shop that's looking for white burgundy or, you know, uh, esoteric Merlots from California from the 90s or 80s that they have a huge collection of is going to be like, I want a Hall Merlot from 1991, but also a Yellowtail. So our biggest thing right now is encouraging, like I've just gotten back from a a big trip. Um, It's encouraging more producers to like, hey, you have wine you're going to sell onto the bulk market otherwise. Keep some of it back. Like you grew it. Like let let's do let's do something together and get it out into the market. Um, the quality going up, I think, is going to be this, the thing that you're going to see the biggest difference in. Sure. And like, there's some stuff we were talking a little bit about before we started um, shooting. Like, suppliers are limited by like co-packers and like sustainability efforts and things like that. That like that that are genuinely important but you have to get to a certain scale. And I think one of the biggest sort of like wool over our eyes moments as consumers that we have become just comfortable with is that we are told that the alcohol in these products is actually the thing that's valuable. Right. And not just the experience and how delicious it is. Or the other ingredients that go into actually giving it body flavor, sure. botanicals, etc. cetera. Um, and so I think, like, with scale, you're going to see the prices come down on some products. I think with scale, you're going to see more complex and unique products come to market, um, which is why I'm so excited about, like, where we are right now. It's just super early. Yeah. And so I think one of the things that I've realized over the last couple of months in doing all this research is, like, you still drink. You still go. I do. Yep. You still have a wine shop. I do. And that's the majority of NA consumers, right? Uh, yeah, uh, almost nine in 10 of our customers drink. Okay. And do you feel like that number is going to kind of stay flat going forward or how do you, how do you envision your customer changing um, over the next couple of years? So I, I think the definition of like still drink is going to change quite a bit, right? Like we all go to our doctor and our doctor's is like, well, how many, how many alcoholic drinks do you have a week? Yeah. And we all lie and we're like, oh, you know, three to five and they're like per day, per night bottles. Like what is that exactly? Right. Um, Alcohol is poison. Like, it's delicious poison, but it's poison. Mm -hmm. There's no amount of it that is good for you, despite, like, the random studies that... Glass of wine a night is supposed to be nice. Sure. Um, (laughs) Sponsored by the American Wine Association? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, Like... Right, you know, of course. If the American Egg Board tells you that eggs eggs are good, like, we should all take it with, like, slightly more than a grain. But that may be the case. Um, There's antioxidant properties and et et cetera. But, But, like... What I find myself doing now is actually being more um, thoughtful about what I drink, and it's more of a special moment rather than a crutch. Sure. Like, if COVID taught us one thing, it was like, like, my wine shop was dropping off, like, two cases of wine to me at, mm-hmm. at like, the beginning of COVID, and I was like, oh, my God. And then uh, my wife started going through IVF. And I was like, all right, like, I'm not going to drink with you. Like, we're going to, you know, we're going to experience this together. And she was making some massive sacrifices, obviously. Um, And, like, you know, two weeks turned into four weeks, turned into eight weeks. And one night she looked at me and she was like, I need a Negroni really bad. But she couldn't drink still because we were on round two. And uh, so, like, I got online and I started looking. 
And what I found were a bunch of brands trying to sell me the individual ingredients for a Negroni like a mattress. Right. Like, never tasted it before. I need to have three different accounts with three different companies, hit three <laughs> different shipping minimums. And I was like, this is not going to scale. Like, this is not going to work. Um, and so, like, bringing all that together has kind of been, like, the, the genesis for... And is it true, I, I think I saw this in an article that from, I don't know if that it was that exact genesis, but it was 43 days from then to when you guys opened your first stop? Yeah. How? How is that possible? Uh, I don't know. Blind optimism. Okay. Um, believe it or not, uh, at the very, like, bottom of everyone's um, sort of relationship that we had and continue to have with COVID, you just put yourself in your mindset of um, every store on your retail high street has a for, for rent sign in it. Mm-hmm. New York is still closed. None of us have vaccines yet. No one's riding the subway. No one's going anywhere. We're all working from home. We're all drinking too much. And I was walking down Court Street and saw a sign up in the window. And I called. It actually said no brokers. And I was like, ooh, this is, this is like a family that owns this. And it was actually a family that lived right down the street from like that, that, that actual building. And they were like, so you're like a coffee shop. And I was like, no. He's like, I, I don't want a liquor store. I was like, no, no, but we're, we're not that either. And, like, it took a little while for them to, like, figure it out. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, it was just like a please, please trust, please trust me. Please mm-hmm. trust us. Like, we're, we're going to give this a try. Um, and they're like, okay, yeah, sure. Like, whatever. If you guys want to pay the rent, like, that's fine. Um, so we went into a store that used to be an abnormal beauty company. And, um, like they had basically like done all these like awesome subway tiles on the store, and, like everything else. We're like, well, we don't have to do s- subway tiles. Cause like we right. can't afford those anyway. And, uh, we like double masks and went to an Ikea and like bought all of our shelves. And the one thing I guess I like, I'm sort of like glossing over a little bit is like, I have worked in startups and like consumer marketing for a really long time. And so, the nuts and bolts of like putting everything together to make sure like all the tech kind of came together had like a leg up there. Sure. Yeah. Obviously. Um, you know, but like when it really came down to it, um, we just felt like we, we like saw the need, like really, really succinctly saw the need. And we felt like if it was going to work anywhere, it was going to work in a neighborhood of professionals, likely in the same general time of their life that we were in. Families, kids, professionals, busy jobs, disillusioned by the amount of alcohol they were consuming during COVID, wanting to find these products, but likely dealing with the exact same route to, do I want to try this as anyone else? Right. And then the one last thing that was like, obviously super helpful to us is that in New York City and in New York, you are not allowed to carry non-out in a liquor store. Really? So like, if you go to a liquor store, they will sell you vodka, but not the tonic or the soda. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to go somewhere else to buy that. Uh, and so all these products, none of them were making it into anywhere in New York City because everywhere else, like a Southern or an R&DC could sell them. And those companies didn't have any non-out customers in New York. And so there was no easy route to market for them. Gotcha. Um, and so we were just able, I mean, New York is a fiercely neighborhood-driven, very, like, intra-neighborhood um, community. And so, like... That idea of, like, you're not going to, like, come from the Upper West Side to go shopping for N.A. and Cobble Hill. Right. That's what allowed us to go from, like, one to five really quickly. Because, like, once people started to figure out about it, it was like, oh, well, how, how soon can, can you, like, you get to my neighborhood? Because there's enough people within my neighborhood that would make sense. Okay. Fast forward a couple years yep. from then. Recently, you guys got big investment. Yep. From Pernod Ricard. Practice uh, pronouncing that. Pronouncing that. Yeah. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I think so. Okay. I mean, I, I'm sure they would probably correct you or me um, at some point, but yeah. So I think it's $5 million. Yep. You guys already are across the country. Yep. Where, where are you going? Um, like, I sort of, like, alluded to it a little bit before, but, um, you know, we're really sort of evolving um, our thinking about the 
the role that our stores and our platform in general can play in curating the category as it continues to grow. Sure. And so building this flywheel of like identifying brands super early where we can get really great early feedback in our retail stores, get them onto our e-commerce platform to proliferate and make them more widely available, get them onto restaurant and bar menus in, in key parts of the country. And then beyond that, how do we help them scale into their own Amazon stores, their own D2C? Like we do fulfillment for a number of brands now. We're like, we import them. They come off of a container from overseas into our warehouses. We do their D2C. We do their, e you know, their e-commerce D2C. We right. do their Amazon store. Um, we do their B2B sales. Like we're actually looking essentially at continuing to build out what we're basically calling like the go-to-market platform for NA. Sure. Um, and so there'll be time, there'll be times obviously where, um, the brands will grow up and they'll get, you know, bigger and they'll be able to resource against that. But we feel like this category is so new that they're going to continue to be, um, they're going to continue to be new brands that are pushing boundaries that will look to us as being the first place for product market fit and validation. So gotcha. that's kind of what we're looking at. I do. I, was that we were asking we we talked for a while earlier so we yeah. covered a lot of stuff yeah, yeah, yeah. but one of the questions I I do really want to ask you and I think is my only sort of like um, anxiety I think with NA products yep. and I think it's the aggressive marketing of like health and wellness yeah. and in terms of like nootropics and adaptogens yeah. and I think you know like hot water is a product that I think people love but if you look at their can it says like nootropics, adaptogens, whatever, right there. Yeah. Um, I've talked to some other people that run bottle shops, and they say that they have people that kind of help translate out what this stuff is supposed to really mean to their customers. Yeah. Um, you know, I have been anxious before. I've went and I've grabbed a product that told me I wasn't going to have anxiety after. Yeah. Didn't do anything. Yeah. And so I'm curious, like, where that goes forward and, like, how you guys approach sort of that language because I think it can be, at times – whether intentional or not, a little like predatory on people's emotions. Um, first of all, uh, I could not possibly agree with you more. Okay. Um, I think that to a large extent, the fact that we live in this world between the TTB that regulates alcohol mm -hmm. and the FDA, which if you've watched uh, John Oliver's pretty broad takedown of the FDA and food labeling in the United States yep. is, is pretty spot on. Um, you can say almost anything that you want as long as you put this label at the bottom that says, like, you know, these statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. Sure. Um, so let's take a step back and let's actually talk about what the nootropics and adaptogenics are trying to do. What they're trying to do is mimic alcohol in the sense that they want to break the blood-brain barrier and give you the same feeling of serotonin and euphoria that alcohol does without the come down of you know, your liver processing alcohol. The poison. The, the poison piece. Right. Right? The blood-brain barrier uh, jump hasn't really happened. Like, it's the product innovation that's missing. Sure. To, to date. Um, and so, technically, at the right levels, with the right level of absorption, reishi mushroom, lion's mane, ashwagandha, etc., there are, you know, like, studies but not lots of studies that will tell you that those individual ingredients can do those things i i wish that more brands would lean heavily into their overall reason for including those ingredients as a flavor component and not as a this will solve all your problems because i think alcohol tells us that it will solve our problems totally. way too often like there there are no alcohol commercials that will show you um people like like having a depressed evening on the couch. No, they're like always having the best time of their life. Yeah, yeah, it is like, like it's the reason why they sponsor sports teams and music and all of that stuff because it's like it, they've got to put you in that mindset, right? For sure. Now, there are health claims that I think NA could make that they would be well served to do, like the fact that we have food labeling on the back of all the NA products and you can see objectively what ingredients are in there, what preservatives are in there, and what calories and sugar are in there. Right. NA wine has 65% less calories than regular wine. Sure. You have no idea with that bottle of Sonoma Couture or Mark West or whatever, what additives or other, other ingredients they've put into it because they do not have to tell you. 
there is a, I think it's Apothic Red, maybe. I, you'll have to check me. But I want to say that there's like one of the most prolific red wines in America has 53 grams of sugar per liter. Gross. Like not that much less than like Coca-Cola. Sure. But it is one of, it is one of the, the like most drank red wines in America. It is empty calories that people are putting in. We actually have more customers that when they talk about health with us, they're talking about reducing liquid calories. They're talking about reducing, um, having some objective and transparent understanding of what they're putting in their body. There are things that you probably have back here that don't have to tell you that they're not vegan, but aren't vegan. Right. Like there, there are wine. There's wine making processes that actually use animal ingredients to like slow down certain parts of the wine making process. Like none of that labeling is required by the TTB. It is by the FDA, but not by the TTB. Alcohol is regulated by the TTB, not by the, like that's the part where I feel like we could do a lot more. And is there like an association between companies that are kind of just product forward and that are like flavor forward? I, I, I feel like Gia isn't that like wellness forward. And I imagine it's no. one of the more popular products on your guys' stores. Yeah. So I'm curious, like if you could maybe go through some of the more popular things that you guys carry and like think through whether or not they actually have that wellness stuff. Cause I feel like from where, I, what I'm seeing is they don't. Yeah. Um, so the most popular category of products we carry is dealcoys wine. Okay. Um, within that subset of products, um, as you might imagine, sparkling wine does better than almost anything else. And not only does it do better, it's almost the singularly biggest predictor of repeat rate for us overall for customers coming back because if they start with dealcoholized sparkling wine. The taste delta is low enough that they come back and they're like, oh, I could absolutely replace a, a bottle of sparkling on a Tuesday or a Thursday night with this and feel totally fine with it. There's the occasion element of it, it too, it's the right? Yeah, yeah, it's the occasion, yeah, the occasion element too. Um, then you kind of go down to like still white and rosé, like more fruit and floral forward whites like um, Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand, from South Africa does really well. Rieslings from Germany do really well. Um, and then I think second category for us is probably botanical spirits. Okay. Um, and that's like not trying to be gin, but gin inspired. So like uh, Pentire does really well for us. Um, but I think like the really kind of sleeper category that we've seen just like absolutely explode for us is um, is actually just NA aperitifs. Like, like yeah, like Wilfred's, um, like Pathfinder. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they are ingredients that if you talk to cocktail mixologists, like for eight years before we, my family, we just moved out um, to the suburbs uh, after a long time in New York City. But we lived across the street from Leanda. We lived literally two doors down from Clover Club. So like Julie and Ivy are really good friends of mine. When Ivy got Pathfinder the first day, I got it delivered to home and she got it delivered to Leanda. And she texted me a picture of the bottle and she was like, yo. And I was like, yeah. Like, it's the first time that I got a bottle of what they described as, it's an Amaro. Like, it is a, it's a virgin hemp seed Amaro. Um, it's made with hemp seed. It's not CBD because it's hemp seed and not, not the actual flower. Right. Um, but I knew exactly what to do with it, and she knew exactly what to do with it. And she's like, alcohol or not, this is a really great Amaro that would be a really great modifier or, or sub-ingredient sub in a cocktail. Those are the areas where, to your point about, like, are you trying to be an analog of what this other thing was, or are you trying to be your own thing? That's where I think there's, like, a really unique opportunity in the category. Like, if you look at Gia, Melanie knows exactly what she's, what she's building. She and her team have built a beautiful, incredible liquid in, a, in an absolutely stunning bottle that stands off the shelf. And they've also said, if you don't want to bring the bottle to the beach or to the park with you, here are some ready to drinks that we've already done the work for you and actually like made it so you can throw them in your backpack or throw them into a cooler. That's so easy for me to describe to somebody like this is what you want to do with it. I feel like there's unlimited room for delicious things. Yes. But they're like it's a very finite group of people that are gonna win like the nutritional wellness yeah. thing. It's like yeah. probably the people with the most money and the best scientists are gonna win that. And then I think there's always room for someone to figure out a couple combinations that work yeah. and make people taste good. Yep. Um okay, I 
want to kind of wrap up and go to a few last questions here. Sure. I really appreciate you doing all this. Yeah, no worries. Um, so something I, I want to think about is you guys are the biggest NA bottle shop. You are across the country. Yep. I think I'm curious what your perspective is on what the industry is going to look like five years from now in terms of the businesses that sell this stuff. Because I have a wine, sh- I have a wine shop in my neighborhood. If you go, you know, around the corner, there's a wine shop. Like you have a wine shop, right? Very intimate relationship. It doesn't feel very corporate. It feels like that guy has his whole soul in that store, yep. whatever. So do you think that the industry will be dominated by a few large chains, likely yourself, and maybe if a competitor that does really well, or it will kind of be a balance between big and small, or you think, like, I imagine you think you guys are going to do well. But, like, how do you how do you imagine it, like, playing out in terms of, like, shops? Yeah, so the one thing that I will tell you is that if you walk into our shops, I think for the most part, um, they have the backing of our supply chain and logistics network, but they're still very much neighborhood shops. Yeah. Like, like our team, I was at our Upper East Side store last night, and I was actually, like, quizzing our team. It was like, do you know who your best customers are? Like, do you know who comes in on Tuesdays, on Thursdays? Like, there are people that come in, like, multiple times a week to our stores. And in that sense, I did actually intend, it was an intentional decision to build them in neighborhoods like if you look at some of if you look at some of um uh some other folks that have opened retail shops they've tried to open them in like like i'll give you i mean like in the interest of being like really honest we opened a we opened a temporary pop-up shop in rockefeller center yeah um wouldn't you know it like what what actually makes us a neighborhood shop is like people that live there Right. So, like, we actually had more regular customers that came in that, like, worked for NBC mm-hmm. than, like, tourists that came in. Because, like, the tourists just, like, didn't get it. They were on their way to Top of the Rock. It, like, did not work for us at all. Sure. Um, thankfully, it was a year. It was a pop-up. We didn't have to renew it. Like, whatever else. But, like, every year, like, Cobble Hill's in its third year now. And we're still growing in that market. Like both both returning customer rate and dollars are going up and new customers are still coming in and finding us. But they're very hyper hyper localized. I think like to actually answer your question, what I think is going to happen is there will be a very broad set of, of proven NA brands that become more ubiquitous into grocery because grocery kind of knows that they can build a four foot section of like what right. this looks like. I think there will continue to be independent retailers because there are going to be people that like feel very strongly about like that sort of independent piece. Sure. And it's low like overhead, right? Like if I, yeah. like there's no licensing I imagine. Nope. Right. So like if I think I have a better curation than you, I could open a shop and then like, I'd probably lose, but like there's, it's, it's realistic that like, it wouldn't be a crazy thing to get into if you're really passionate about it. Yeah. And I mean, and I mean, I like, I'll tell you for, for us, it's pretty transparent. Like our longer term vision is to not be reliant on any one of those channels for our continued growth is that we actually want to participate across a lot of them. Now, like, like we sell products to other bottle shops around the country because like we're importers of some of these brands. I don't really consider them competitors. I actually just consider them colleagues because we're not at a point yet where like this category is like, oh my gosh, like I'm going to buy from brand A and, you know, multi-brand retailer A versus B because of whatever. Now, like we do, I think a really good job with our loyalty program to like actually keep our most engaged customers coming back. Um, You know, if you look at our, our, our mix of products versus others, there are going to be others that carry products that we don't carry. And we've made a purposeful choice not to carry them because we've seen that be negative customer response or like, we just don't think the liquid quality is high or whatever else. Um, I think five years from now off premise, you're going to see, um, I think our stores will likely be, um, probably like sort of more flagships in the city and their last mile delivery hubs for like our ability to get products to consumers quickly. Um, I think that off-premise consumption in general will probably be dominated by traditional grocery and we wanna obviously play a role in that. I think on-premise, um, on-premise is still a little bit like Wild West because I, I, I made the analogy to you um, when we were chatting before that um, 
like Red Bull didn't go to like water and soda distributors and be like, I want you to distribute us. Or they didn't go to alcohol distributors and say, I want you to distribute us. They're like, this is a refrigerator. We're putting it behind your bar. Mm -hmm. You have to fill it with Red Bull. This is what it needs to look like. This is how you need to serve it next to the rest of the alcohol that you're serving it with. It was a very purposeful decision of like the way that they decided to do that. And I think if you've got like a frontline salesperson that's selling alcohol and like their bonus is based on how many thousand cases of Tanqueray they move. Sure. If they get 15 minutes with a food and beverage manager, you really think they're going to be like, let me tell you about this NA category that isn't bonusing me at all. Right. Like, I don't think they're the best served to do that, which is why what we have that traditional distributors don't have is consumer data. Sure. We actually have a relationship with our customers. Like, oh, like I have 12,000 customers within a mile of my Cobble Hill store. So when a restaurant near Cobble Hill asks me, what should we put on our menu? I can actually tell them what we've sold and what people come back and buy all the time within that mile radius. And so, like, that is a thing traditional alcohol distributors, that they're just one step removed purposely um, from having that consumer data. And so we think that that's going to be unique, and we, we really kind of see that as being a big opportunity. But I, I think, um, man, I think if you would have said three years ago that we would, have, we would be where we are, like, I want to say I would have believed you because, like, we had some pretty strong ambitions when we launched. Um, but five or ten years from now, it's – I. I would shudder to even wonder what it's going to look like then. Okay. So using some of that data yeah. for, this is my final question. Yep. Um, say, and I don't know if this is something you guys have thought about, but say Boisson is opening a bar. Maybe we'll call it Nick's lounge. All right. And I'm I giving hope, you God, three taps. <laughs> yeah. And I want you to pick three, the three beers that you want on tap. Yep. A wine. Yeah. And a ready to drink cocktail. Oh. And what you kind of build out. Yeah. We can, I can kind of workshop it with you. Yeah. I want you to kind of like build out what you think would, would work well in that setting using that data. Uh, like today, today's today. data. Yeah. Um, so, uh, first of all, we'll just set aside that tap and a beer is really difficult. Hypothetical. Yeah. yeah. Let's call um, it, let's do, let's do cans. We'll cl- no, no, okay. we'll, we'll do a close. We'll do close line. Like sure. you know, we'll, we'll get it done. Um, not just because we're drinking it. I think that Al's, deserves a tap handle anywhere and yeah. like i'm extremely excited about that i know you talked about he's them, the man al, al dapuri is the man yeah um uh, i i say this like without a, without like you know i always tell him like uh, this is no disrespect but like i imagine a ping pong ball like playing beer pong <laughs> when i close my eyes after like drinking owls because like it literally feels like a session beer that i can just crush like totally. all day long um there is uh, there is a beer that is not yet available in the U.S. that I am um, like I want really bad. Sure. Um, that I hope possibly coming to the U.S. Possibly coming to the U.S. Okay. Um, I hope um, we've we've talked to them ab- about it. Um, have you ever tried Lucky Saint? No. Okay. Um, you ever tried Camden Lager? Like, no. Okay. So like. Like, London, you know, like, the pubs that you go to, the kind of traditional, like, English lager, unfiltered lager. Um, Lucky Saint is on tap at over 600 pubs in the UK. They are in over 6,000 pubs in the bottle. And they are, like, quite possibly my favorite NA beer, period. Um I, w- I want them on the tap handle, like, really bad. Sweet. So I, would, too. I, I would, like, I would like check a keg to bring it back with me if I could do that. Um, the last beer, I would say probably, um, goodness, uh, I would say probably Untitled Art okay. is actually one of, one of my favorites. Tried that one. Um, they, uh, this is going to sound really weird, but they actually have a watermelon beer that is, like, really delicious. Is that um, the Goza? Yeah, the watermelon Goza. That one's fire. Uh, it's impossible. We literally cannot keep it in stock. Like, I don't know if it's, like, a the manufacturing or, like, what. We can't keep it. I, I'm just obsessed with it. Like, summertime for me equals watermelon, so, like, that is what it is. Maybe it's growing up in the South. I don't know. Um, so, like, those would be my three. Yep. Uh, I'm just not, like, like, I'm not, like, an IPA, double IPA, like, how many IPAs can we do? Um, that's just not me. Sure. Um, then you said what wine? 
You do, yeah, one wine, maybe two. One wine, maybe two. Uh, I would say, um, I would say, sparkling would be uh, Thompson and Scott's naughty Chardonnay, <laughs> um, and still would likely be. This is like a toss up, I think, for me between loudest Sauvignon Blanc from South Africa and Lights Riesling from Germany. Okay. Like, so forgive me, but three. Sure. Um, and then you said ready to drinks. Yeah, a cocktail. Um, probably lime and salt Gia. Okay. That's like, I I have a unreasonable amount of Gia at my house right now, and that's kind of what I get into. They make great stuff. Really do. Awesome. Well, yeah. Nick, thank you for stopping Thanks, by. Thanks, man. Love this. Yeah. Learned a ton, and uh, love to have you come by anytime you want. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm available. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs>